and welcome to this Bible study on Paul's letter to the Philippians. I'm hoping you're sheltering in place and taking good care and being uh, safe during this time. And I'm pleased to be able to share some of God's word with us and to uh, look at Paul's letter to the Philippians, which is a wonderful letter. So let's get started. And uh, uh, if you're uh, watching this on Facebook afterwards, uh, I'll be available to, through uh, the magic of the internet, uh, to engage any questions you might have. So uh, there should be a, a Word document that has uh, my notes uh, for uh, all the sessions that we'll be doing, all four sessions, uh, that's somewhere attached uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, you'll find it. If, if you can't find it, uh, send me an email and I'll be glad to send it to you uh, uh, the old-fashioned way through email which is becoming the old-fashioned way these days, I guess, isn't it? Anyway, let us pray. Lord, you caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. Help us to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it, that we may ever hold fast to the blessed hope you give us in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, Paul's letter to the Philippians is really um, different than, than some of his other letters. A lot of his letters were written kind of addressing a congregation's pathology. And, and St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians, it's really at the end of his earthly life. Uh, he's in prison in Rome. He's waiting to find out whether he's going to be executed or, or freed by Caesar's decree. And he, he wants to send a letter to uh, his beloved congregation in Philippi, encouraging them to stand fast in the faith. And one of the things that's remarkable about this letter is that he uses the word joy over 16 times in a very, very short letter, a letter that we now only call ha having four chapters. And he uses that word joy over 16 times. And for Paul, joy doesn't preclude suffering or preclude problems in one's life. Um, so often you hear in a lot of popular uh, Christianity that, you know, uh, uh, we shouldn't have any problems. We shouldn't suffer. If we're just faithful to Jesus, everything will be fine. Well, Paul is writing about joy while he is in prison and he is full of joy. And he's writing to a congregation that's suffering quite a bit themselves under Roman rule and yet he insists that they have joy as well, and they do. So the, the joy that Paul talks about is not kind of um, uh, a good feeling inside, a warm fuzzy. For, for Paul, joy is a communal joy. It's the joy of the, of the folk gathered in faith who are what he would call in Christ Jesus. Those of us who are in Christ Jesus have this joy. It's rooted in in the body of Christ, the body of Christ gathered to exalt and praise the name of the Lord. Those who are in Christ, or as Paul will say, in the Lord Jesus or in Christ Jesus, don't experience joy as an abstract theological proposition or some sort of doctrinal statement. Rather, it's an organic reality. It's a joy found in the church's common life. Now, as I said earlier, Paul is writing from prison, and we know that from verse 14 and 17 in chapter 1. We think it's around 61 to 63 AD. So the, the sufferings and the indignities that he's experiencing in prison make this message of joy all the more powerful. The letter's also written, at least in part, as kind of a thank you note from Paul to the congregation at Philippi. Epaphroditus, who was a member of the congregation at Philippi, was sent to Paul while he was in prison by the church there to bring him a gift. And it's uh, some sort of monetary gift, something that will support Paul in his life in prison. But while Epaphroditus was there with Paul, he fell ill and got quite sick. And Paul uses the occasion of this letter then to thank the Philippians for their gift, but also to assure them that Epaphroditus is now well. 
As I said earlier, the, the letter was also written to shore up the faith of the church at Philippi. Philippi was really an important city in the Roman province of Macedonia. And it was quite polytheistic and, and religious syncretism uh, was widespread. Syncretism is a word that, that scholars use to describe the melding together of various religious experiences and religious uh, practices and faith. So it was a, a place of, of polytheism and religious syncretism. Its citizens, by and large, also had, how, how do I describe this, a rather inordinate pride in their city's importance, and particularly in the pagan shrines of the city. So that's why Paul, in this letter, really emphasizes again and again humility, as humility is a necessary virtue for the Christian life. And Paul warns them strongly against idolatry. So that's a good kind of quick overview of what Paul is talking about, we'll be talking about in his letter. So let's, let's get right into the text. And I'll be reading from the Revised Standard Version. You may have a different version there. Um, really, to be honest, it's the Revised Scott Version because I will throw in some of my own uh, translation meekly offered here. Um, but uh, use whatever good translation you have, and they're, they're probably not that different, but I'll be using the Revised uh, Standard Version. So we'll begin with a greeting. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul identifies himself right away as the co-author of this letter. It's not a letter written only by him. It's also written along with Timothy. And we know from other sources that Timothy was a native of nearby Lystra. And after his conversion, he had helped Paul begin the church at Philippi. So Timothy was kind of a co-founding pastor of the church at Philippi. Notice right away the language there. He refers to those in Christ Jesus in the greeting and the address. It's a recurring theme, so pay attention to that. The, the over uh, statement of Paul again and again of those in Christ Jesus. So let's continue on with Paul's opening prayer for the Philippians. This is verse three and through five. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now that will, like in a lot of Paul's letters, kind of introduce language that will be themes throughout the letter. So Paul offers, first of all, thanks for their gospel partnership. Now that's a language we're going to see, that's a word we're going to see again and again in this letter. Partnership here means more than simply uh, just a working together like business partners would work together. The Greek here for partnership is koinonia, and that's a word maybe you've heard used as an English word, and uh, it often means fellowship or uh, gathering together, uh, working together, things like that. But for Paul, the Greek word koinonia means a partnership that's grounded in something more than simply a contract. It's a covenantal fellowship. It's something that is binding because all who are bound in it are in Christ Jesus. As I said, koinonia will be a recurring theme throughout the letter. And Paul states that, that koinonia is actually a necessary prerequisite to living the Christian life. One can't be in Christ Jesus, Paul says, without koinonia. And notice the language also of thanksgiving here. Thanksgiving for Paul is grounded in God's grace and God's peace. Thanksgiving that thus then kind of emanates, if you will, from one's trust in God's grace. Let's continue on with verse six. And now I am sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion 
at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, or y'all, right? Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that you may love that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness which come through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now notice here what Paul is doing. He says the good work that God has begun in the Philippians refers to God's activity bringing his saving grace to the world. Paul then uses this opportunity right away to compare the grace that they have received with his own situation in prison. How about that? To feel thanksgiving and the grace of God even while you are in prison. And Paul there in verse 9 makes it clear that his hope is that their love will grow with, with the maturity that comes from the knowledge of God and the discernment of the Holy Spirit. Love that isn't purposeful or focused is easily manipulated and abstracted, isn't it? That's, we know that from our own experience. Godly love comes from knowing God's purpose in the world and by the ability to make truthful discernment of that purpose. Let's go on to verse 10 and 11, which I just read. Paul refers here in 10 and 11 to knowledge, and that's the word where we get Gnosticism from. The Greek there is epinosis, say. Um, the, the knowledge, the epinosis of God and the discernment of the Spirit is a necessary prerequisite for a life that's pure and blameless. So this life that Paul's talking about, this Christian life to be in Christ Jesus, is not to be idle, but it will produce what Paul calls the fruit of righteousness. Not a righteousness that is found in us. We're not pure and blameless because we've learned how to be perfect or without sin. It's a righteousness that's imputed to us by the grace of God. We ourselves are not righteous. God makes us righteous because of God's grace, not by our works. So Paul calls this fruit of righteousness, the uh, outcome, if you will, of the grace imputed to each of us. Now let's move on to Paul's particular circumstances for why he's writing this letter. He follows this opening greeting and kind of introduction, if you will, with a reflection on his personal, personal circumstances in prison. He's waiting, as I said earlier, to find out whether he's going to be freed or whether he'll be executed. And then Paul writes about, again, rejoicing in this current situation he is in. Come what may, cost what it will, Paul rejoices with whatever outcome of his life because God is always faithful. God, Paul says, uses our circumstances to work out God's purposes in the world. So let's read through verses 12 through 30, and I'll probably stop in between um, some of those verses to, to make comment on them. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, that's namely his imprisonment, has really served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard, that was the, the elite kind of shock troopers that the, the emperor had, and they did uh, all the important work of guarding the emperor and guarding prisoners 
in and around Rome. It's been known throughout the entire Praetorian Guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of all, the brothers and sisters have been made confident in the Lord because of my imprisonment and are much more bold to speak the word of God without fear. See, notice Paul's not interested in self-pity at all here. And it's so easy for us, isn't it? It's so easy for me to fall into self-pity. It's a, a natural human reaction. His imprisonment, Paul discerns, is for the advancement of the gospel. And that's what Paul wants to focus on. Verse 15 in the following. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of partisanship. Now, notice the partisanship is exactly the opposite of, of the partnership language Paul used. It's kind of anti-koinonia. Partisanship is anti-koinonia. The former proclaim Christ out of partisanship, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Isn't it wonderful how Paul makes this argument? He says, I don't even care if you're doing it for the wrong reasons. I don't care if you're proclaiming the gospel out of partisanship. I don't care if you're doing it uh, without even knowing it. The fact is the gospel is being proclaimed. And Paul is going to rejoice in the gospel being proclaimed. He didn't really care whether it's out of, of goodwill or out of partisanship. The gospel is being proclaimed, and that's really, for Paul, all that matters. Verse 19. Yes, and I shall rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I shall not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If it is to be life in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am a hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Notice what Paul is doing here. He, he is saying it really doesn't matter to him personally what happens to him. The focus he has is on them. It's on them. What is going to build them up? What is going to be for their account, he says. Convinced of this, Paul continues, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that, you, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Now, Paul, notice he's not a masochist here. He, he doesn't want to die. He doesn't have a death wish. He realizes, though, that the gospel is the most important thing and that his one life is not as important as the gospel. So in, in many ways, he's joyfully circumspect about his life. He thanks them for their prayers. He clearly hopes his imprisonment results in his freedom. He wants to see them again. He wants to visit them again. He wants to be physically present with them again. But he also accepts the possibility that the execution may be in his future. And we know from Christian history, that's exactly what happened to Paul. Now, he does say, my personal preference is to be with Christ Jesus. But he also says what's more important is the proclamation of the gospel and its furtherance. And if that means he must stay in the flesh and be freed and return to them, 
Well, building up the church is the most important thing for Paul. Verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side. Notice the language again of partnership there. Stand firm in one spirit, side by side. Partnership language. For the faith of the gospel. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear omen to them of their destruction. But of your salvation and that from God. For it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you shouldn't only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engage in the same, in partnership language, the same conflict which you saw and now hear to be mine. Now, the language there at the beginning, manner of life, that Greek word is from the same word that we now get politics. And boy, as soon as anybody raises the language of politics, right away people go off on stuff, don't they? Believe me, I've heard from many of you who don't like uh, <clears throat> when I use politics. But politics here is not the partisanship we see in our country today. Politics for Paul is simply the the organizing of one's common life together. So the manner of life is the politics of life, how we're going to organize our life together and live together. Paul's example of Christ's humility here, and we'll see that that's a foreshadowing of what he's going to do in chapter 2, which we'll get to next week. Paul foreshadows Christ's example of hum humility and servanthood and says that must define the politics of of the church. Christ's humility and Christ's servanthood is the politics of the church, and it's our only basis for unity as the church. As soon as the church begins to, to leave the focus of Christ's humility and servanthood and begin practicing things that it's best for itself or looking out for its only, only its own good, then the church has left Christ. So Paul is is really driving home the point that the manner of life of the church needs to reflect Christ's humility and Christ's servanthood. It's the church's steadfast faith and its steadfastness in the faith, really, that, that, that comes to be in the midst of suffering. And isn't that really appropriate for us now? And the suffering that many of our brothers and sisters are, are facing due to this virus, the suffering that, that, that we don't necessarily experience ourselves, but we hear about, that we're locked up in our houses and, and not able to, to go out and, and, and hug and, and be with people that we love and care about. There's a level of suffering in that. And Paul says it is the church's steadfastness in the midst of suffering that he says becomes an omen to those who, uh, who oppose the church and oppose God's mission through the church. So he says the Philippians should accept their suffering because it's to be expected. The gospel, Paul says, is always going to produce conflict. The more the church focuses on Christ's humility and Christ's manner of life, and adopts that as its own, it's going to really anger people because the larger culture is not geared that way, is it? The larger culture is not geared towards humility and self-sacrifice and servanthood. And the more the church engages in that, it's really going to tee people off. Not always, but so often it's going to really show the church to be in conflict with the dominant culture. This is a very powerful and central theme to Paul's letter here. 
And we're going to see that played out in great detail uh, next week when we get into chapter 2. But I want to leave you with that idea. And maybe a what if. What if every church in the Diocese of Georgia began to fashion its manner of life on the humility and servanthood of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be the most powerful witness we could make to the truth of the gospel? That those of us who are in Christ Jesus are not in it for our own sake. We're not in it for our own benefit. We're not in it to make a buck or to to curry favor or to have some self-importance or to feel that we're holier than other people. What if we say those of us who are in Christ Jesus are in it for the humility and the opportunity to serve our fellow neighbors because we're in Christ Jesus? Wouldn't it be an amazing witness that if every time somebody looked at one of our churches in Georgia, they would say, Those people look like Jesus. Look at their humility. Look at the way they serve their neighbors. Look at the way that they don't look out out for their own selves first, but they look out for the other first. That's how they will know we are in Christ Jesus. That's how we ourselves will know that we remain in Christ Jesus. It's just like that old camp song we sing. They will know we are Christians by our love. Those of us who are in Christ Jesus are called to a manner of life that has humility and servanthood at its core. Until next time, look forward to seeing you next week and begin to share chapter two in Paul's letter to the Philippians. So long for now, and may God bless you.